Well, good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. I told the uh, early service, it's good to come into the house of the Lord after a UK basketball win, but it's also great to come into the house of the Lord after a UK basketball win against Arkansas. Um, <laughs> No, it's always great to be in the house of the Lord, coming together to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter what the occasion. Our scriptural call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 33, that very psalm that we looked at on the screen. Verses 1 through 5 says this, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make music to him with a ten-stringed harp. Sing a new song to him. Play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is trustworthy. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the Lord's unfailing love. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Welcome you to our morning worship service. It's so good to see the, uh, the, the church gathered together and uh, here to worship. Uh, and we are so thankful uh, for your presence. And also want to say welcome to uh, those who are visiting. If you are here today with a, a family member or friend, uh, we are honored by your presence and are glad to have you gathering with us. Our purpose and intent is to worship the Lord, and uh, we pray you'll be encouraged by this time as we do that. So welcome, and God bless you, and uh, we are uh, looking forward to a wonderful day today uh, through this time and then this evening, a special time at the church uh, together in special fellowship, and we'll tell you more about that later. But this is our time to pause and to give thanks and to pray and to uh, seek the Lord uh, in our prayer time and we have some special prayer burdens that we want you to know about and be aware of uh, especially be in prayer for brother Jesse Bourne uh, brother Jesse uh, still recovering from hip surgery he also is uh, healing from pneumonia and brother Jesse is uh, probably one of the uh, finest most faithful godly men uh, that our community has the joy to call one of our own. And so we want to keep him in prayer today, uh, especially pray for his family uh, as they are uh, helping him and working through this. And then as you well are well aware that Brother uh, uh, Mark Wright, who is uh, facing a real battle with cancer, uh, trying to go through some rehab, wanting to get home, uh, to be with his family here, uh, Mark had a few setbacks this week uh, after going to rehab, had to go back to the hospital. Uh, 
is seemingly responding well to the antibiotic right now. So let's pray for Mark and Janet and Thomas. It's just a very difficult time uh, that they are going through. So we need to keep them in prayer and, uh, and keep them lifted up. So let's do that. Would you join me as we pause for this moment? Just take a moment quietly. Just uh, express to the Lord what's on your heart. You may have a praise. You may have a word of thanks. Or maybe you have a burden that you need to just place before the Lord right now. Lay before the altar. Let's do that so we can truly worship Him together. Father, we humbly bow here before you as the body of Christ. Lord, we recognize our unworthiness. We recognize that if it was not for the fact that, that Jesus came and sacrificed himself, that we would be totally without hope. Father, we thank you for the initiative that you took in securing our redemption, our salvation, our pardon, our forgiveness, our hope of eternal life. And today, this service is a time that we hope will magnify that. We want to give you praise. We say together, Lord, in our hearts, praise the Lord for what you have done, that you have redeemed us by the blood of your Son, Lord. And I pray right now that you would prepare us, that as we seek to give you what you are worthy of, the praise of your people, May it be genuine, may we be true in all that we sing, all that we say, and all that we do. Lord, we want to pause to pray for these dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ that are going through a challenging journey. We lift up Brother Jesse to you. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of this saint. Bless him as he battles through these setbacks in his body. Encourage him, may in his mind and heart, he feel the very peace and presence of the Lord today. We pray for Mark today, Lord, and we pray as Mark too has walked through a very difficult journey with cancer. We pray for him that you will help the infection to heal. We pray for the rehab and therapy, but we pray he would soon be able to be home. Be with Janet, Thomas, Judy, Bernie, family. Lord, bless them and encourage them today as only you can. Now, Father, we, we present ourselves to you right now as an act of worship. Oh, Holy Spirit, speak. Give us ears to hear you and help us to respond in a way that will please you, Lord. Bless now this time of worship and bless those who have gathered. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 104, 1 says, My soul praise the Lord. Lord, my God, you are very great. We're going to stand and we're going to sing together about that great God. Oh, worship the King. Oh, worship the King of
this morning. I see a lot of frowny faces. We're singing about grace, the greatest gift ever given, God's grace. Let's sing that chorus one more time and sing it, lift it up. We're singing about grace this morning, church. Sing this with me. Grace.
copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Hosea. We'll be in chapter 2 for our scripture reading this morning. We're going to be starting in verse 14, and God's Word reads this. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of a car a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. And no longer will you call my name my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of, on the, of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in injustice. In steadfast love and in mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. And you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. And the earth shall answer the grain, and the wine, and the oil. And they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say, not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Glory be to God this morning. Let's continue it to worship. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the Oh, 
so much to give thanks to God, and we have so much to praise Him, and I think that song uh, encompasses all that Christ has done for us. You know, I've always said, no matter how bad the day may be going, no matter the difficulty that you're facing, uh, just knowing you're saved is enough to give praise to the Lord, uh, that we have been rescued We've been redeemed. And uh, the Bible says, count your many blessings, name them one by one. Start with one. Number one, I'm saved. <laughs> That's enough to just give God praise for a lifetime. Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Today, we have the joy of examining an event that we will all be a part of. It's kind of neat to be able to read the scriptures of something that is going to happen and to know that as you're reading this passage, John has already seen it with his eyes. He saw you. If you're a child of God, John in his vision saw you at this wonderful event that Revelation describes for us. We're looking into the future. We are anticipating the moment when this will all happen. And we're going to be a part of this. So we're getting to see uh, something that is, has not happened that will happen. And that if you're saved, you will be there. You will be there for this wondrous event. And it's called the marriage of the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb. In chapter 19, we begin... And the scripture, then it says, after these things. Now, we saw that these things refer to the death blow to religion. It is the death blow to the devil's counterfeit of all that God has given to us. You know, the devil counterfeits everything that is good and holy. You know, God has a word and, and the devil has a doctrine of demons. Uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus is our our Savior, He is called the Christ, and what do we have? The devil has his Antichrist. And we recognize that the devil has been defeated. Uh, the world religion, the world one world government has been given the death blow in chapter 17 and 18. And then John sees this event uh, that will happen in the heavens. He said, after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, which shows there's going to be many who are in heaven. There will be a multitude of folks that will go to heaven. 
And uh, we know that in comparison to hell, it seems as few, but Jesus even said that. But that doesn't mean there will not be a great multitude in heaven. And here this multitude has gathered together. And look at what they're doing. And they said, Alleluia, or Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments, because He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. Now we know that's a reference to chapter 17 and 18. And this represents the false religion of the tribulation period, and it will be utterly destroyed, and all of the influence uh, that it had had. And then it says, And he has avenged on her the blood of his servant shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen! Alleluia! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, at the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And when we come to this section of Scripture, we realize as we've been working through this book that there's coming a time in the tribulation period where the judgment of God will fall upon this wicked, wicked planet. Evil will be judged. Justice will prevail. Righteousness will reign. And God will demonstrate His holy sovereignty over all things. But here we come to that point where we get a glimpse of the, an event that awaits every child of God, every Christian, the church that is awaiting us, that we're able to look ahead, to think about heaven, to think about what is going on and will go on in the presence of the Lord. And I find it interesting that it uses the theme of a marriage. You know, when you look in the Bible, marriage is often used to teach a, a principle it symbolizes a matter. You know, we look in the Old Testament and you'll find the phraseology for Israel as being the wife of Jehovah. The wife of Jehovah. And you find in the book of Hosea, as it was read, that Hosea, led of the Lord, speaks of the infidelity, the spiritual adultery of Israel, describing it in that type of manner. How Israel, the wife of Jehovah, has been unfaithful uh, to the Lord God. Jesus in his parables, especially Matthew 22, where he uses the picture of a marriage feast that teaches this principle concerning the apostasy of Israel, how Israel had been unfaithful. And there in that Matthew 22 passage, speaking of this marriage feast and, and the ones who had to be invited, the guests who had to be invited representing not the church, not, not the church, but, uh, but those who uh, had been invited into that relationship, the Gentiles. And here we have that picture through a marriage feast. In Matthew 25, we see the symbolism of Christ teaching through the avenue of marriage, the spiritual preparedness that every Christian ought to be ready, waiting, looking, uh, for the Lord, uh, calling them home or the rapture of the church. And in Matthew 25, speaking of those ten virgins, those attendants who are, are not the bride of Christ that are spoken of there, 
but those who will attend the bride. And, and the theme of that is to teach us spiritually being prepared for when we're called to go home. Being ready as a child of God. Not ashamed at the time that the Lord will take us home. And so here we come to this section of Scripture. In the midst of tribulation, we see jubilation. In the midst of all of the pain, we see this time of celebration, this time of joy that is demonstrated through the marriage of the Lamb. And so God chose this picture of marriage to illustrate, to illustrate that glorious moment when we will become one with our Lord. You know, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. That means that Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride of Christ. Israel, when God chose uh, the, the covenant people, people will ask, why did God choose them? Was it because they were better than all the other nations? Was it because they were good, they were holy? No, they weren't. But God in His sovereignty chose them to be His covenant people. And when we come to this age of the church, we wonder, why did God institute the church? Why is the institution of the church seen throughout the New Testament from the day of Pentecost up until the rapture of the church? Why did God do that? The only explanation is in, it's His sovereign grace. That's all. That's the only way we can describe that. But we know there's coming a point where there will be this celebration when the church, the bride of Christ, will come and be in the very presence of the, the bridegroom. And when we think about this scene here, and we think about the theme that surrounds a, a wedding, basically, the marriage. You know, I thought about the weddings that I've been a, had the joy of officiating and being a part of. And, and you know what I find? It, it's, it's fun to go to a wedding. But having experienced the other side of preparing for one, it's not as fun, is it? <laughs> you know, you may say, yeah, it's a lot of fun to show up and enjoy the festivities and the, and the free food and the celebration. It's another thing when you're that mom or you're that one who is putting in the time and the months and days of getting ready for that wonderful event. You know, in this passage of Scripture, it teaches us about our preparation and how to be ready. It teaches about the one who we will celebrate. But I have found that in any good wedding, the first thing you need is music. You know what I mean? I'm finding that in my later years of pastoring that a lot of times the couples that I marry, they don't have as much music as they used to. There's not as many songs sung. There's not as much music that is played, it seems. And I always try to encourage them if they have this mistaken idea that, well, we don't need to have a lot of music. Oh, no. No, you need the music. This is a time of celebration and when I look at this wonderful marriage that is going to ensue in the future, notice the emphasis on the music part of that time. First of all, it says there in verse 1, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to the Lord our God. Any of you have ever heard the Hallelujah Chorus? You ever been a part of that? Well, Handel's great composition was inspired through the reading of the Bible. It was the reading of this section of Scripture that led him in, in that composition. And, and here we see this emphasis. And if you notice here, four times you find the phrase, Alleluia. And then verse 3, Alleluia. Verse 4, all of these. What does that mean? Well, that first part. Hallel means praise. And then the second part of that word means Yahweh. Literally, it means praise the Lord. You know, every now and then, if the Lord just blesses you, it's okay to speak out and say hallelujah in a church service. It's okay to say hallelujah. You know, you can go anywhere in the world, no matter where you go, and you can say hallelujah, and they know what it means. It's just one of those words that means the same thing wherever you go. You know what it means? It means Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so what will happen at this marriage, what will happen at this wedding day, it will be a time of rejoicing and praise to God. And Christians, you're going to be there. And I tell you, this is the good time to be practicing. That's why we sing together. You know, we don't put songs in the bulletin to be fillers. 
to say, well, we just need something to fill up a little time because we sure don't want Brad preaching any, any longer than he preaches already. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, I have a, a, an opportunity uh, to go to Brazil here in a month with nine other representatives in the state of Kentucky for one week and a Send Vision tour. And I got an email said, now, while you're there, you'll have a chance probably to share your testimony several times. You'll probably have a chance to teach a Sunday school lesson and also maybe to preach. And they said, now, your sermon needs to be a 15-minute sermon in light of the translator. And I thought to myself, I don't, I don't think I own one of those kind of sermons. Uh, what's a 15-minute sermon? You know, you're saying, amen? You know, that's where, yeah. Let me tell you. We don't put songs in the bulletin just to fill some time and take a little time. We do it because that's what we want to practice. We want to be prepared. We want to be ready. I tell you, this, these young couples will come and we have a rehearsal the night before the wedding. What are we doing? We're rehearsing. We're getting ready how to walk in, where you're supposed to stand. Is the music going to be right? Uh, are we okay? Is everything look ready? And this is our rehearsal time, church. We're getting ready to go in the presence of the Lord and we want to be ready to sing and to praise God when that day comes. So praise the Lord now so you're ready then. But notice some of the things they praise Him about. In verse 1, they praise Him for His redemption. They praise Him for salvation. Notice, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. They are praising the Lord that they had been saved. I think sometimes, Christians, we get over being saved. We forget that we were lost. We just need to have a moment to pause and say, Man, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Do you remember being lost and separated from God? The emptiness and the void of life. I tell you, it's a shame as a Christian that we forget how wonderful it is to, to be saved. That we're redeemed. And we will praise the Lord at that moment about our salvation. But then notice, it's interesting in verse 2, they praise Him for the retribution that He will pour out on the earth. It says, He has judged the great harlot. The great harlot represents all that is evil, all that is false. Wickedness, the false prophet, the false teaching, the one world church, the one world government. This is speaking of the fact that in heaven they will praise God that He has made all things right. They praise God that justice has finally prevailed. He will avenge those who have been persecuted. There will be the fact that vengeance belongs to the Lord and vengeance will fall. And we live in a world where justice does not prevail and things are not right. We live in a world that is upside down, a world that is evil and wicked. We do things that it is hard to comprehend that a, that a human being would ever devise such a thing. You think about as we are on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade, January 22nd, 1973, 47 years ago, our nation, a Christian nation, voted and approved the killing of babies in the womb of a woman. Murder. How could a civilized, civilized nation come to the conclusion that it's okay to kill a baby in the womb? That's how wicked man is. That has, is how far we have fallen. And imagine over 60 million babies whose lives have been extinguished for convenience sake in the land that we call a land that God has blessed. And we do that. We realize the day is coming that justice will prevail and all things will be right. And they're going to sing about it. They're going to sing about the downfall of wickedness and evil. But they're also going to praise the Lord for the relationship that they have with Him. Look at verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, and those who fear Him, both small and great. There's a terminology there where he says, Praise our God. Do you realize that God is our God? That's why the church gathers. That's why the Bible says don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. We're, we're coming as a family. We're coming together to say we have a Father in heaven. He is God. He is Creator God, but He is also the God that we can know. And we come and we praise Him. We praise Him for the relationship that we can have with Him. 
that we can call him Daddy, Abba, Father. That personal relationship that we can have with God. It is an amazing thing to consider. And they will praise him for that personal relationship. And then we see they praise him for the reign of our Lord and Savior. Verse 6, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and the sound of many thunders saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. There will be praise for the fact that our Savior is supreme, that He reigns above all things. Just imagine that moment in heaven where there will be this exuberant praise that is offered out. I was telling the early service that I, I think one year we took a group over to the Reds game for one of their faith days and, and uh, it was one of those games that was just kind of dragging and things started picking up and I had gone down to get in line to you know, get some concessions and, and about that time there was an eruption of, per, of just voices and shouting and excitement and I, I ran up to look and see what had happened and sure enough I had missed a guy you know, hitting a Grand Slam home run. And so... Um, you know, that just seems to be, uh, to, to be my luck. I thought about how it went from nothing to just this crescendo of praise, of, of, of yelling and shouting. Folks, heaven is going to be a place where there is this, the voice of a multitude in, in one heart and one mind giving praise to God that He reigns above all. A good wedding has music. A good wedding has jubilation and, and singing. And this marriage of the Lamb will include that very thing. But not only that. A good wedding not only has good music, but a good wedding is going to have a bride. The bride that is going to be present. In verse 7 and 8, notice what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. I remember when Libby and I were married and we were old-fashioned. We decided we weren't going to see each other that day and wait till the wedding. And my first, my first, the first thing that I saw that day of her is when that organist hit that certain key and, and that wedding march ensued and those doors opened up and, and there the bride comes walking in. And, and all the attention went on her. You know, fellas, I, I'm sorry. That's just how it is, isn't it? We can look all sharp and clean, have our tucks on, be up here up front, you know, like we're all dignified. And I mean, all it takes is that door opening and that organ hitting that key and then everybody's head turns. It's like you, you're the forgotten one. <laughs> but that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, it's upon her. It's upon the bride in that moment. Ah, oh. And there's that sense of overcoming, the, the sense that she belongs to me and I belong to her. I want to tell you that at this marriage of the Lamb, there will be the beauty of the bride on display. Now, who, who is the bride? It's the church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the bride. When did the church start? Well, the Bible tells us that the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them, there was the beginning of this institution we call the church. And that institution will continue on until the rapture of the church. And folks, I want to tell you, I'm not looking for any signs. I'm not looking for anything to have to be fulfilled. The rapture of the church can happen at any moment. There's nothing left that is hindering the rapture of the church from this world. And that will be the the cessation of that age, of that dispensation, of that church age. And the bride of Christ is the church of the living God. You say, that doesn't seem fair. Well, I tell you, just as when God decided to choose the Jewish people and Israel as His covenant people, it was His sovereign choice, His sovereign grace that did that. And the only thing to explain why he would choose you and I and, and would choose the church that is the institution that is in existence now, that is the family of God, let me tell you, the only explanation is the sovereign grace of God. It's not of works that we've done. It's not because we were more special, but it was because God in His grace chose us. And here we see the church, the dearest object in the universe, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus so loved the church 
that he gave himself for her. Here we see the beauty of the bride. And folks, that leads us to a question. Are we ready for that moment to appear? You know, I think about these weddings that we have to, these girls, the bride, they have to get here hours ahead of time. Man, they've got to get their hair fixed. They've got to get their nails done. They've got to get their makeup fixed. They've got to get dressed. And I mean, they, they have to be ready many times, hours before the event. And I ask myself, what am I doing? What are we doing? What is the church doing to get ready for that moment? What do we have to do to be ready for that moment when the marriage of the Lamb will take place? Well, I agree with what one wrote. He said there's three things that we must do. There's three steps we must take to be ready. Number one, we must be saved. You must be saved to be ready. If you're not saved, you're not a part of the church. If you're not saved, you're not a part of the, uh, this bride festivities. You will not be there for this, this wonderful moment. And so we have to be saved. That's the first step of the beauty treatment, to be ready to be there on that day. You see, God had to do something inside of you. We have these women who go and they're trying to beautify the outside. You know, they've got the makeup and the lipstick and all of the, and the, the beauty of the outside. But what God has to do is He has to change some things on the inside. We need a new nature. All we have is this old sinful nature within us. But He gives to us a new nature, this divine nature. He fills us with the Spirit. And therefore, we are being made ready for that day. So the... So salvation is required to be ready. But I'll tell you a second thing that is required, and that is the rapture of the church. The rapture will have to take place to be ready. When I look at the Scriptures and I examine the book of Revelation, I recognize that the church had a beginning and it has an end. And that end will take place at the rapture. And during those seven years of tribulation upon the world, the gospel will go forth throughout all the world. And Jews and Gentiles alike will, will believe during that period of time but the church will be in the presence of God. We will enjoy this, this time of uninterrupted praise and worship and preparation for this moment that is described in chapter 19. The Bible says that we, we will be changed in a moment into the likeness of Jesus. The old nature will be left behind. We won't have this old sin nature anymore. And so we will be ready by the rapture. And then last of all, We'll be ready by our, our reward. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that every Christian and the church is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And at the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord will examine all of the works that we have done. He will check out the motivations of our heart. And there will be many things that we have done that as Christ looks upon it, it will be like, it will be like gold silver and precious stones. And for those things, we will be honored and rewarded by the Father. And that will ready us for that moment. That is our, our, our beautification moment. That is our getting ready moment for this event of the marriage of the Lamb. So here we see the beauty of the bride. But like any wedding, you not only have good music, you not only have a beautiful bride, but you also have the guests who arrive. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but it's fun to just show up and be able to just slip out. And there will be guests at this moment also. The Bible tells us in verse 9 about those guests. He said to me, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Who will be the guest? Well... They will consist of all the redeemed, all of the saved before and after the church age. When you look at the Old Testament age, you look at that time, we realize they were saved the same way that we are saved. They are saved by grace through faith in the Son of God. And those redeemed saints of the Old Testament age, the Old Testament saints, will be there as guests. You read the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, it speaks of their excitement and joy of looking forward to this event that will take place. And it speaks of it in terms of the gladness that they will have to be the guest at that event. I believe also the tribulation saints, as we know multitudes of people, are going to be saved during the seven-year tribulation. 
from all nations, from all tribes, from all people groups, and from all languages, there will be multiple millions who will accept Christ. They will be called as guests to that occasion. John the Baptist even looked forward to that when he made the statement that he was, or Jesus said of him, that he was a friend of the bridegroom. So we recognize he will be there. Jesus will be the bridegroom of that day. And these guests will all gather in that moment. I want to tell you, it will be a festive occasion. It will be a moment of gladness and great celebration. But then that leads us to one more. For every wedding you've got to have, you need to have some music. You've got to have a bride. There will be the guests. But then you've got to have that old boy that's standing up here beside the preacher to be present to have a wedding. Now, in the weddings that we go to, as we said, there's not, a, there's not much attention. There's not much light that's going to be shining on, on, the, uh, on the bridegroom. The, he, he's just kind of a fixture. But let me tell you, this celebration will be unlike any others. This will be one time that the focus will not be on the bride, but it will be on the bridegroom. Jesus. The Bible tells us in verse 10, John, overwhelmed by this event that will come, he fell at the feet of the one that was speaking to him. The one that was speaking to him quickly said, Don't do that. I'm your fellow servant. Don't worship me. Worship God. And then he makes this statement, For the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of of prophecy. Now what is he saying there? He is reminding John that what he needed to focus on and what he should be concerned about in the midst of all of these revelations that he is getting about the end time. He is reminding John, John, don't worship the events. Don't worship the symbolism. I think it was Adrian Rogers who said that too many times we get concerned about the third toe on the left foot of some beast that we find in the book of Revelation. We want to know what does that mean. And we lose sight of the emphasis of this book. People say, oh, that's a hard book. No, it's not. You know what the book is all about? It's about one thing. In the opening lines of the book, it says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That means this is the unveiling. This is the unveiling. This is the removal of the veil so we can see more clearly the face. Revelation is to help us to see Christ more clearly. Clearly, to see his beauty in a more and significant way. That's what this book is about. And at the marriage, the focus will be upon the bridegroom as he appears. Every detail, every moment there, the focus will be on him. And the messenger said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This means this is about Christ. The focus is upon the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone because He, in that moment, will be glorified as we enter into this union that our minds cannot fathom as we are still in this body. Let me ask you today, are you ready for the marriage of the Lamb? Have you made the preparation necessary for the marriage of the Lamb? Have you personally yielded your life to Christ and you've been saved so that you can be there for the marriage of the Lamb? If not, today you can. Today you can come and yield your life to Christ. It is so simple. It is gloriously simple. It is as simple as one man said ABC. It's as simple as you today admitting you are lost. You are a sinner. And be believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for you. And see, confessing Christ and yielding to Him and saying, I yield my life to Christ. I repent of my sin and I yield my life to Christ. If you've never... Yielded your life in that manner. Today, you need to come. 
It's been a joy in these last couple of weeks of having the privilege of being in the presence of some people that have made that very decision. And you know what I have found? It never gets old to see somebody giving their life to Christ. Every time I just feel like shooting up out of my chair and into glory to say, praise God, another one has gone from darkness into light, from death into life. Oh, maybe you are that one today. Maybe you're that one that needs to come and today be saved so that you're ready and you're prepared and you're a part of this throng of people that will be there for the marriage of the Lamb. But if you say, Brother Brad, I'm saved. I am saved. But quite honestly, I would be ashamed if the Lord called me home today. Then why live another minute? Why live another minute in that state? You can come right now and say, Today, Brother Brad, I, I want to renew my wedding vows to the one who saved me. Today I want to pause and just say, Jesus, I vowed a vow. I committed my life to you and I yielded my life to you, but I have been living in spiritual adultery. I've been unfaithful to you. And today I want to come and ask you to forgive me. I know you haven't removed me and I know you haven't kicked me out of the relationship, but I want to come and ask you to forgive me for my unfaithfulness. And I want to renew my vows unto you. Maybe that's what you need to do. I had to do that when I was 17 years old. And I'm glad. I'm glad I did because he, he accepted me, he forgave me, and he brought me back close to himself in my walk with him. You come this morning. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation, and as we sing... I'm here to help you, to pray with you, to help you. After this service, we can sit down and we can talk about whatever decision you need to make. Say yes today. Make sure you're going to be there for the wonderful event, the marriage of the Lamb. Would you stand with me? And as we sing, if you need to come and pray, if you have a burden you need to lay before the Lord, you come, just come. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit this morning.